Hello, 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 everybody. This is really, really, really exciting for me to be able to speak here. As was mentioned, it was my grandfather, Joe Cruz, who was one of the founders of Amazing Facts. And this is my first time speaking at an official Amazing Facts thing. And so this is pretty cool for me and uh, memorable in my life and probably at some later time in my life, part of my testimony as it will continue for our testimonies never end throughout all of eternity. Amen? Because we'll always have something to say of the goodness of God. Now, my presentation for you this morning is entitled, From Adventism to Adventist. From Adventism to Adventist. What it's going to be is a two-part presentation. This morning is one, and then part two is going to be tomorrow morning. The theme of this presentation is formation, the theme of tomorrow morning's presentation is reformation. In this presentation, I'm going to talk you through my growing up within Adventism. I grew up in a family that practiced Adventism, filled with Adventists, but no one is born as an Adventist. No one is born as a Christian. We are born into families that have certain belief systems, but then as we grow up, that influence affects us, and then we have to make a decision for ourselves. So I'm going to go and walk through my story from my early, uh, my early age up through high school, and then tomorrow I'm going to pick up that story in college until today. So let's go ahead and dive in. With any good story, we have to start with the background of our family. My family, I grew up in, as I already mentioned, a loving Seventh-day Adventist home. Here's a picture of me at my baby dedication. Just a, a few weeks, maybe months old, and there on the right side is my grandfather, his his wife, that's my dad's side. Then on the left side is my mother's parents, my grandfather and my grandmother. My mom is holding my sister, and my father is holding me. This is where I was dedicated to the Lord. I had no choice but to serve him. No. <laughs> dedicated to the Lord. Then we have a picture here of uh, my grandfather tickling my toes here. If, if your grandfather did not rub your feet as a child, I'm sorry you were not loved. <laughs> Then we have the MVP, the most valuable parent in my life. I love my father dearly, but my mother has been the most instrumental person to form within me a love for God. Here's a picture of me and my mom in Israel. This is her favorite place to go, is to walk where Jesus walked. This is um, the Sea of Galilee, where quite literally Jesus walked. If you look right in the background, you actually see a few footprints uh, that Jesus left behind. I'm just kidding. My mother, her name is Sharon. If you drop the SH, you have my name, Aaron. So I came out of my mother in two different kind of ways. My mother instilled in me her own faith. Paul, speaking of Timothy, wrote here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded, is in you also. Just as Timothy inherited, if you will, the genuine faith of his mother and his grandmother, my mother was the rock in my life before I fully accepted Jesus as my rock. My mother showed me what humility looked like. My mother showed me what love looked like. And I never, I can't ever remember a time in my life where I questioned the love of God for me, where I questioned the existence of God, because I saw it in the life of my mom. One core essential thing that my mom taught me, which is going to be a theme throughout this presentation, is that God is always with you. As Jesus said to his disciples as he part, departed up into the heavens, he said, I am with you sometimes. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13, we read, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. My mother, through her life, not just through her lips and what she said, but through her life and her actions, demonstrated to me that God was ever-present in her life. When we say the prayer, dear, dear Lord, please be with us, sometimes I kind of laugh in my head a bit because God is always with us. What really we're asking is not to bring God down to us, but when we say God be with us is God, 
bring to my awareness your presence. Help me not to deny you today. Help me to live my life like Enoch lived, walking with you, talking with you. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that without faith, which is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. If we were hanging out and you completely ignored me, would you be pleasing me? (laughs) If you were treating me as if I didn't exist, it would be hard to have a relationship, wouldn't it? God's like, hey, I'm right here. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hello. But it's by faith that we have to please him to acknowledge that he's actually there. This is what Moses did here. Uh, A few verses later in Hebrew chapter 11, by faith Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible, right? By faith he believed, he's with me, he's by my side, he has power. And let me tell you right now, this isn't my own idea, but as a shield from temptation, note this quote very carefully, as a shield from temptation and an inspiration to purity and truth. Here, who here wants a shield from temptation? Raise your hand. Yeah, me too. Who here wants to have inspiration for purity and truth? Raise your hand. Listen to the language. No other influence equals. What is it? Who wants to know? I'll give it to you. The sense of God's presence. If you live your life walking and talking and living as if God is right there with you, that is the best shield, the best inspiration of purity and truth that you can have. And this is something, by God's grace, was instilled upon me at a very young age. I didn't go through any major rebellion, rebellious spurts. I didn't go through any kind of crazy time in my life for the most part. Here is an example, a story I want to share with you about summer camp. Raise your hand if you've been to summer camp before. Amen. I love summer camp. I've probably been to more years, more summers of summer camp um, than some of you are, have been alive. <laughs> I went to summer camp for 11 years in a row. Okay, maybe, you know, raise your hand if you're below 11 years old. Okay, never mind. You, you beat me. 11 summers in a row, I went to summer camp. And at my summer camp, there was a particular game called the animal game. The animal game was a game of camp-wide campers versus staff hide and go seek. Hide and go seek. What would happen is all of the, uh, the campers would come together at the middle of the camp, and then all of the staff members would go off into the woods, into the cam- off into the campgrounds, and they would hide. And all of the campers would then, after they hear the blowhorn, they would go off and they would look for the staff. And it was called the animal game because every staff member would wear a Uh, a piece of paper that had an animal name written on it, right? It had a name and then it had a point value, right? So it would be like zebra, 50 points, goldfish, five, you know? And then, of course, the lion, which was 100 points, right? That was the maximum catch that you could have, right? So you were hunting for these animals, right? And if you, you found them, you would get the points, and whoever got the most points, their cabin would win, So the very first day of summer camp, we had the camp director. His name was Jesse. And Jesse told all of the campers Sunday afternoon, he said, hey, look, this upcoming Wednesday, we're going to play the animal game. And everyone loved the animal game. Yeah, the animal game, can't wait. And then he said, and this year, I'm going to be the lion. And if you find me, you'll get 100 points. But if you find me, you won't just get 100 points. You'll get 100 points dollars. Whoa! All the kids were going crazy. I was maybe about 12, 13 years old, and I was like, whoa, I want to find, you know, Jesse, the camp director. I can't wait to find him and get the $100. $100? You can do anything with that. You can buy like a brand new car. You can buy a yacht. I mean, fill in the blank, $100 as a 12-year-old? Everyone's just like, I can't wait. I, oh, I can't believe it. And so everyone's kind of thinking to themselves, you know, brainstorming in preparation for Wednesday night for the animal game. Where, where could I find Jesse? You know, and they're kind of, I know I was mental mapping in my, in my mind, like where could be the best places that he could be hiding? And it was probably Monday, maybe Tuesday evening. I had some little free time, some downtime uh, there. And I, I remember thinking to myself, man, how can I find Jesse? 
And all of a sudden, it hit me. God knows where Jesse is, right? God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows everything. God says, I'm always with you, right? Okay, so I was in the habit of talking with God about all kinds of things, and so I, I, I started praying and talking to God. I say, hey, God, um, I would really like to find the camp director and get the hundred dollars. That'd be really cool. I know you know where he's at. Could you just kind of like tell me? And God's like, yeah, I can do that. I'm, I'm capable of doing that. But what are you going to do with the money? You see, God loves to talk with us and he loves us to just come to him as we are. God, I want the money. I want to buy a brand new house. Okay, that's okay, a little, little much there, but what else could you do with the money? And I began to think to myself, well, at, at about that age, I began to realize something about the, how much summer camp cost, right? And that my parents, I don't come from a well-to-do family, right? But every uh, one summer, I went to summer camp for four weeks, right? The end of the, the, the first week, I would, my parents were there to pick me up. I'm like, Mom, Dad, can I please stay one more week? And I would see them go, and they would talk amongst themselves, talk about the finances, talk about whatever, and they'd come back and say, all right, Aaron, you can stay another week. Yes! And I would go, and I'd stay another week. And at the end of that week, I'd be like, Mom, Dad, can I stay another week, please? And they'd let me stay. And I was beginning to understand that going to summer camp was a few hundred dollars every week, and so four weeks is like over a thousand dollars. And so I thought to myself, well, of course, God, I want to return 10% of that to you. And then I want to give the other $90 to my parents as a thank you, as a thank you for sending me to summer camp. God likes to work with us through prayer, hone in on our motivations behind what we're asking for. But then God prompted me to ask, to tell him and say, God, if there's someone else who needs the, more, the money more than me and my family, I want them to find Jesse. I want them to find it. So if I don't find him, that's okay, but I believe that you can tell me where he is hiding. And so that's the prayer I prayed to God. Next day comes, the animal game begins. There's, you know, a, a couple hundred campers, you know, little tween campers, you know, ages 11 to 13, right? they're, they're running all over the place. The game lasted a total of 15 minutes. After 10 minutes, there was one blowhorn that indicated to everyone there's five minutes left. Okay? After the expiration of that final five minutes, there was a double blow horn, eh, eh, which indicated game over, right? Then all the camp staff would come out of hiding if they weren't found, et cetera, et cetera. So there I was, running my legs off, right? Running through the poison ivy, running through the bushes, looking behind every tree, looking under every stone, right? Thinking of all the places where Jesse could possibly be hiding. A minute goes by, two minutes, three, four, five, six, seven. I find someone, it's the giraffe. I find someone, ah, oh, it's the goldfish, okay. 10 minutes go by, eh, I hear the blow horn. I'm like, okay, in my mind I'm thinking, okay, I've got about five minutes left, where haven't I gone? I, I'm there, I'm looking, I'm like, aha, uh, uh, he's not there, right? I'm going, I'm looking, ah, he's not there. Four minutes left, three minutes left, two minutes left. There's about two or one minutes left, and I kind of have a, br a breather moment, and I say, all these campers are beginning to walk back to the center of camp, anticipating the end of the game. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I've looked everywhere, and he's nowhere to be found. And I paused in that moment, and I prayed, and I talked with God. I said, God, I know you could have shown me where he was hiding, and for whatever reason, you chose not to, and I'm fine with that. Maybe someone else found him. That's cool. It would be nice if I could find him, but thank you for being real, for loving me, and hearing my prayer. As soon as I was done praying that, this overwhelming sense told me, walk that way. I was like, okay. I started just walking. I'm like, everyone's going that way, and I'm going this way. And I'm walking this way, and I'm like, I, I literally, it, it was like, I don't know where I'm going. I'm like going down this random path into this kind of like foresty area that it wasn't very thick forest, um, it was just kind of like very open, and I began to walk down this little path, and, and I'm just walking, like really not even thinking about what I'm doing, and then all of a sudden, this voice told me, stop, stop. It said, look out into the woods there. I looked out, it was just empty woods. No one was hiding there that I could tell. 
and he was like, walk into the woods. Now I'm feeling like this is now really weird. I'm just like, walking into the woods, and, and I'm just like, really kind of like, uh, and then something was like, stop. So I stopped, and I'm there. <laughs> All the kids are like way over there, and I'm just like standing there, and then I'm like, okay. And then all of a sudden, I just kind of looked around, and then I looked down, and I was like, what? Is, that a, is that a leg? And I just kind of leaned down, and I, I touch it, I'm like, that's a human. It's, that's, a, what? And then slowly but surely, up comes standing. You'll find out tomorrow morning. I'm just kidding. Up comes standing. Jesse, the camp director. As he was standing up, literally seconds after I tagged him, you know what I heard? Eh, eh, game over. What do you think I was overwhelmed with? Dude, God brought me exactly here. Like, the idea of the $100 was so far behind me. I was just like, dude... God, like, grabbed me by the hand and was like, let's go. Let's go. Over here. Yeah, right here. Yeah, he's, right, he's right. Look down. And he, I tag him with literally seconds left. I go back, and, and sure enough, he pays me $100 cash in front of that. I was, to say the least, the most popular camper that week. <laughs> but I was, the whole time, it was surreal. Like, I was like, God is real. I, I mean, I believed it. I wasn't testing God. And they're like, are you real, God? It was like, I'm believing you're real. And then he, he's like, yeah, I'm real, affirming my faith. Later that evening, there was a, a worship, as there always was, and I go to um, you know, the, the worship, and my cabin's in the back, and the camp director taps me on the shoulder, and he pulls me aside, and he says, hey, Aaron, just between me and you, did anyone tell you where I was hiding? Because he's thinking, like, oh, come on, this kid, with literally seconds left, comes, makes a beeline right to where I'm at, he's like, one of, those, one of those kitchen staff snitched on me, right? They, they saw where I was hiding, and they told their favorite camper. So he's thinking, like, come on, man, spill the beans. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, what's the answer to the question? Did someone tell me where he's hiding? Yes. I knew what he was asking, but the answer was yes. And so I'm like, because <gasps> <gasps> I'm being overwhelmed with, like, this reality. And he's probably thinking, like, yeah, that's, come on, kid, you crying, you guilty, you guilty. And I'm just like, yes, I was praying, and like, God. <laughs> and he's noticing he's having like a scene, and, you know, and he's like, let's go on a little walk. And so we go on a little walk, and he brings me to the camp story. He's like, get at it, whatever. I'm like, oh, get a popsicle. And, and I'm there, and, and I'm, I tell him the story. Like I was praying, and I asked God to show me, and God direct me, and then I learned a few very valuable lessons that day. One of them is this, 1 John chapter 5. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, how? According to his will, he hears us. I was there, and I was asking something, and God was like, that's, that's good, but let's ask that according to my will. And then the verse goes on, and it says, <laughs> and it says, and if we know that he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Notice that if we know that he hears us, meaning if you really believe that he's always with you and will never forsake you, if you know he's real, if you know he exists, if you know he cares for you, and you ask according to his will, you got it. And that's exactly what I learned as a 12-year-old. I also learned that God likes to wait to the last second. <laughs> Why? Because he wants to make sure that we realize this was totally him. He brings the children of Israel to the Red Sea between a, you know, a rock and, a, and an ocean, right? And they're like, ah, we can't do it. And he says, you're now right where I want you to realize that it's not you who are going to save yourself. It's not you who are going to come up with the mastermind plot you know, to look under every log behind every tree to find Jesse for yourself, but I'm the one who held you by your hand and brought you and answered your prayers. That is the animal game. That's where I was affirmed in my faith as a young kid. Then, the next checkpoint in my life of a strong spiritual experience was in 10th grade. 10th grade Bible class, I had a teacher by the name of Cameron DeVazier. 
Uh, I grew up in Maryland, Bling Bling Silver Spring, if you've ever been there. It's where the General Conference is. And Cameron DeVazier was my 10th grade Bible teacher. I'll reference him tomorrow. This is a picture of me with uh, Mr. D at uh, graduation. And this is a picture with me and Mr. D, Cameron DeVazier, just a couple years ago at Michigan Conference Camp Meeting. Both of us on the platform as pastors together. Who would have thought that my, I would become a pastor in the same conference as my 10th grade Bible teacher? At the time, ministry was so far from my mind. Not that I was against God or anything, but just like a pastor? Like underwater basket weaving? Is that a thing? Like I just didn't know, right? But God has amazing ways that he is going to lead in your life and he led in my life. What was so significant about that 10th grade Bible class was that we took a deep dive into Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy. For the first time in my life, I had been, I, I was getting taught in a systematic way through the major prophecies of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, 8, 9, Revelation 13, 14, 12. Then we went into Adventist history, and I saw how Adventism was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We went into the inspiration of, of, of Ellen White and the various questions that I may have had were, were answered. The various questions I had as to, you know, why should I trust the Bible over and against the Quran, over and against whatever world religion? Uh, and then more specifically, why should I be an Adventist over a Baptist or a Methodist or an Episcopalian or a you name it, right? Those questions at an intellectual level were answered for me during that 10th grade Bible class. And what I want to go through you here briefly is the purpose of prophecy. During that 10th grade year, I learned about prophecy, but I want to share with you what was going on in my mind, the experience that I was having as I was going through and learning these prophecies. Who here has ever seen a Bible prophecy chart like this before? Who here has passed out at the sight of it? <laughs> Be careful. Here is a prophecy chart. The 1260, the 2300, 538, 1798, 1844, right, uh, 1798, you know, the seven last plagues, the, the 490, 483, the 70 weeks, Woo! These things can begin to give you a headache. But if we take a step back and we say, what is the purpose of prophecy? We take a look and we see that the first purpose of prophecy is that it gives us confidence. It would really be better at this point for just to have my slides on the screen to give us confidence, confidence that the Bible can be trusted, amen? Number two, the purpose of prophecy is to give us a context of where we are in the flow of salvation history. And number three, Bible prophecy, most importantly, points us to and fills our hearts with Jesus Christ. So let's begin to systematically unpack each one of these briefly. Number one, confidence. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 19. He says, I am telling you this now, when? before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may what? Believe, have confidence that I am he. There is a confidence that is built when someone says, I'm telling you something beforehand. Notice this is a quote from a, an atheist, a skeptic, right? In his book, 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God. One of those chapters is, well, my God foretells ancient prophecies, and here he tries to debunk each one of these reasons why people give for believing in a God. But here, when he gets to the reason of ancient prophecies, notice what he says. He says, if there were just one precise and detailed prediction that came true and could only be explained as the work of a God, no matter if it were the Bible, Quran, Torah, Bhagavad Gita, Dianetics, David Koresh's diary, and so on, I would not ignore or deny it. I would not ignore or deny it, he says. He then goes on to write, he gives an example of what a Bible prophecy could look like, and he says, look, if a believer can show me a prophecy with that kind of detail, I'm on board with their religion, sign me up. Beloved, we have an anchor in Bible prophecy that we can know that the Bible can be trusted, amen? We can know this, for example, if I went about and I began to riddle off predictions, right? If I said to you, in one week's time, you're going to meet a girl, her name will be Ashley, and, you know, she'll say something to you. 
Then a week after that, you're going to meet the president, and this is going to happen, right? Prediction one, prediction two, prediction three, prediction four, prediction five. I, if I just began to say out things that are going to happen in your life, first you're going to be like, okay, are you a prophet or the son of a prophet? You're kind of weird, man. But then, let's say, I'm not going to say this is going to happen, but let's say those predictions started coming true. Whoa. Your confidence in my predictive ability is being increased. This is exactly what we find when we come to Daniel chapter 2. We have prediction after prediction after, after prediction. Here in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar receives a dream. And Daniel interprets the dream. He says, you, O king, are this head of gold. Boom, prediction number one, Babylon. Then he says, but after you will come another kingdom, a chest of silver. We look at history, it's Medo-Persia. Then a third kingdom, Greece. Then a fourth kingdom, Rome. I want you to notice what Daniel doesn't say. He doesn't say, then there'll be a fifth kingdom, and a sixth kingdom, and a seventh. He says there'll be one kingdom, two kingdom, three kingdom, four kingdom, then the fourth kingdom, who knows what's going to happen to it, will be divided. He doesn't say one kingdom, two kingdom, third kingdom's divided. He says one, two, three, four, then the fourth one is divided. This could not have been done by any other means other than a God revealing the future. Here we have divided Rome written down in history, literally well over a thousand year, years, 2,000 plus years before it happened, God's word predicted it. Daniel ends by saying, the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Bible prophecy gives us confidence that the Bible can be trusted. And that's what I was anchored in when I was in 10th grade. Then I discovered that Bible prophecy gives us a context for where we are in the flow of salvation history. For example, right? Are you guys living, are we living during the time of Babylon? Yes or no? Are we living during the time of Medo-Persia? Yes or no? Greece? Rome? Divided Rome? Yes. Where we are presently located is during the toes. This is a timeline, right? We're living in the toenails of time. That's why everything around us stinks. We are living during divided Rome. And the next thing to happen in this prophecy is the stone, the second coming, is going to come and destroy the kingdoms of this world. It's like going into a mall that you've never been in before. You go into, and the first thing you need to do is find the directory. You say, oh, I am here, and I'm trying to get to TJ Maxx, because you know they got the deals, right? So I'm here, I need to go down, make a left, past Dill Dillard's, and then on my right is TJ Maxx. In the Bible, there's this concept called present truth, and it's what prophecy points us to and highlights, right? Present truth is what Peter calls it. What was the present truth during Noah's day? 120 years, and the flood's coming. It didn't matter what you believed, other than you better get into the ark, or else it doesn't matter if you're even Michael Phelps, you won't be surviving this flood, right? The present truth in Lot's day, Sodom and Gomorrah is going to burn, baby, let's get out. The present truth during the time of Moses, the 400, 430 year prophecy had expired, and it's time to get the people out of Egypt. How about the prophets? All of the ancient prophets spoke a present truth message to the people they were ministering to. John the Baptist said, I come to prepare the way for the Lord, and Jesus Christ came. And Jesus, as our model and exemplar, showed us how to operate one's life according to Bible prophecy. The very first recorded sermon of Jesus, he said these words, the time is what? Fulfilled. What time is Jesus referring to? Jesus is referring to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 62 and 7, 69 prophetic weeks. Jesus knew when he was 12 years old, he waited until he was 30 because he was looking at the context of prophecy for when to begin his ministry. Then, in the middle of the week, the prophecy said that he would bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And that's right when, after three and a half years of ministry, Jesus laid down his life. Jesus said strange things to his mom, like, hey, woman, my hour's not yet come. Hey, brothers, my time has not yet come. Hey, people, my hour has not yet come. They tried to lay their hands on him, and he's like, nope, see ya. 
hour has not yet come. But then a time did come. The hour has come as he's praying there a few days before the crucifixion. Jesus knew that his hour had come. Father, he prays, the hour has come. And then on the cross, he says, it is finished. Jesus lived his life according to the context of Bible prophecy. And I saw in 10th grade that, whoa, if that's what Jesus did, that's what I want to do. But the prophecy goes on to say that the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Jesus knew that because of his rejection as the Messiah, the people would destroy themselves through the Romans coming in. And so Jesus said in Luke 19, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Jesus said, you're going to be destroyed. And why? Notice carefully what he says. Because you did not know the what? The time of your visitation. Beloved, Bible prophecy gives us the time when things are fulfilled. And if we're not paying close attention, we're going to, mix, we're going to miss the prophetic context for where we're living in. But most importantly, Bible prophecy points us to Jesus Christ. Here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter writes, So we have, what kind of word confirmed, everyone? The prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star, this is Jesus, rises in your, where? Hearts. Beloved, it's as plain as can be. Peter says, as you study Bible prophecy... You are allowing Jesus to fill with his light the darkest place in your existence, your heart. Just like the morning star. What's our morning star we call here on planet Earth? The sun. Every morning, that big old star comes up, right? And it's like someone's got a dimmer. If you've seen the sunrise, of course you have, right? Little by little, the brightness gets more and more and more. When I was in 10th grade, every day I went into Mr. D's class. I'm there. I'm, we're learning about Daniel 2. Whoa, God can be trusted. The Bible's real and reliable. Whoa, you know, Daniel 7, the apostasy of the Christian church. Whoa, all of these various things. What happened little by little is that Jesus began to fill more and more of my heart and more and more of my attention. There's a National Geographic article that I read um, a, a number of years ago, actually, and the, the, the main title of the, uh, this magazine was uh, Finding True Love, right? This was the, uh, the highlighted article in this magazine. And I was like, oh, Finding True Love, who doesn't want to find that? You know what I'm saying? And so I began to read this article, and I came across this quote, which I found to be incredibly fascinating. Notice what it says. Luckily, I've learned of other options for restarting love. Arthur Aaron, it's funny because his last name is my first name. A psychologist at Stony Brook University in New York conducted an experiment that illuminates some of the mechanisms by which people become and stay attracted. He recruited a group of men and women and put opposite sex pairs in rooms together, instructing each pair to perform a series of tasks, which included two things. Number one, telling each other personal details about themselves. Then number two, he then asked each couple to share, stare into each other's eyes for two minutes. After this encounter, Aaron found most of the couples, previously strangers to each other, reported feelings of attraction. In fact, one couple went on to marry. Now, this isn't revolutionary stuff, right? Sharing personal details about yourself, right? And then looking into someone's eyes. Now, question, is staring into someone's eyes intense or just like casual? It's intense, right? There's a reason, you know, if you've got high EQ, you look at someone in the eye and then you kind of look away and you look back right? Because there's something really intense. And so when you're forced to stare into someone's eyes, there's an intimacy that begins to build. And then you're sharing personal details about your life. What are you sharing? You're sharing about your past. This is where I grew up. This is where I'm from. This is where I went to school. You share about your present. This is what I'm doing now. I'm a pastor, et cetera, et cetera. You share about your future. These are the plans I have. This is what I would like to do with my life. You share that with another person. I'm telling you it works, right? I'm in a relationship right now, and I love looking into her eyes, and I love sharing personal details about herself. I love planning for the future together. Beloved, let me tell you something. Studying Bible prophecy, throw it on the screen, studying Bible prophecy is doing none other than looking 
into the eyes of Jesus. Is Bible prophecy intense? Absolutely it can be intense, but so is looking into someone's eyes. Is sharing about your past kind of making yourself vulnerable? Is it scary to think about the future sometimes? This is what prophecy is, is Jesus saying, let me tell you about my past, how I was covenantally faithful. Let me tell you about what I'm doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary. Let me tell you about the plans I have for you in the future. I can't wait to get married. We're going to have this big marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be awesome. No wonder the most prophetic book in the Bible, the very first verse says the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Because prophecy is all about Jesus letting his light and his love fill our hearts. A blessing is promised to those who read, hear, and keep the things written in the book of Revelation. In 10th grade, I finally had someone who took the time systematically, day by day, to go through Bible prophecy. And let me tell you what, the foundation of my faith, the formation of my faith Adventism, although I I believed it already in the sense of God is real, he loves me, but now my head, my intellect was being anchored with reasons for why I'm a Christian, reasons of why I'm a Christian rather, uh, an Adventist rather than something else. In Daniel chapter 2, there were the wise men who spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar, and there's something that they did not understand about God. Notice what they said to the king. The thing that the king asks is difficult. That is the dream and the interpretation. And no one can show it to the king except who? The gods. They got that much right. But then what is their theology of God? Whose dwelling is not with flesh. God is aloof. He's afar off. He's not close to us. But what's the biblical story? John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, God himself, becoming incarnate in flesh, came, as Bible prophecy said he would. And there was Jesus, born of a virgin. There was Jesus growing up, praying every day, starting his day out strong. There was Jesus hanging on the cross, not for himself, but for your sins, as Bible prophecy said would happen. There's Jesus being resurrected from the tomb. There's Jesus going up into the heavenly sanctuary, interceding on our behalf. And there's Jesus. The last of, the, of these to come true is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. These are all things that prophecy foretold would happen. And here we have Jesus. This is Pastor Carlos's favorite saying, Maranatha, right? Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. These were all the things that formed my faith when I was your age. And I would encourage you to spend time going through Bible prophecy and studying for yourself. Going through this quickly now, what we have is that Jesus is going to come again, but Jesus says before he comes, what does he say has to happen? The gospel needs to be preached into all the world. How much of the world? All of the world. Then we turn to the book of Revelation, and what we find is the only time that the word gospel is used in the book of Revelation is here in Revelation 14, verse 6. And here, there's an angel preaching the everlasting gospel to who? Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So what we have here is the fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen in Matthew 24, right? The gospel would be preached into all the world. It takes the form of three angels. We call this the three angels angels messages it's summarized in the form of one two three angels the first angel is a call to worship god as the creator the second angel is a call to come out of babylon babylon is fallen the third angel is a warning against false systems of religious worship then there's the climax here are those who keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus then right after that in verse 14 jesus is depicted as coming with a sharp sickle to reap the harvest of the earth These are the three most important messages ever to be delivered to the world. And I began to unpack those through my 10th grade Bible teacher. He began to show me that the first angel's message, right? Fear God and give glory to him. What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give glory to him? He unpacked that. This is the gospel message to go to the world. Whoa, this is so cool. He began to unpack the hour of his judgment has come. What does that mean? Daniel chapter 8, the cleansing of the the sanctuary. What is the judgment hour message? 
He, he began to unpack uh, what it means to worship him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and springs of water. This is a call to the Sabbath, to remember the commandment that has been forgotten. He began to unpack who Babylon is. What does it mean that Babylon is, is, is fallen? What is the wine of Babylon? I'm beginning to just be thrilled, like, whoa, this makes so much sense. Christianity became apostate in the first few centuries of Christendom. Then all kinds of error and false beliefs came into the church. And this is why there's so many different denominations. Because all of these different denominations are just at varying degrees of coming out of Babylon, coming out of religious confusion. I was like, this makes so much sense. Then the third angel's message is a warning against worshiping the beast. Well, if you're going to warn someone against worshiping the beast, his image receiving his mark, what is God going to say? Like, don't worship the beast. Okay, I won't. Who's the beast? I won't tell you. I learned who the beast was. I was like, wow, why aren't more people talking about this? Don't receive his mark or else it'll be bad news. What's the mark? We unpack what the mark is, right? What is the nature of hell? Being tormented with fire and brimstone, tormented at all these things. What is the nature of hell? I learned the truth about hell for myself from the scriptures themselves. And then, of course, the climactic verse there. Here is the patient endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Not nine, but all ten of them. My faith was being anchored and rooted in a way that I, would, that I was so thrilled and so excited about. The mission statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is this. Make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. Beloved, it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist, Lutheran, Calvinist, Episcopalian, uh, Puritan, Seventh-day Adventist, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you should want to know at the very least what the everlasting gospel is found in the three angels' messages. And here I'm discovering that as a church, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, it's not only just like kind of a part of what we believe, but it is our mission statement. I'm like, this is a no-brainer. Of course I'm going to be an Adventist. Of course Adventism is, you know, is the thing. Because it became so clear to me as I studied Scripture. And that's what God wants for all of us. The Seventh-day Adventist church. The Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and source of our beliefs. We consider our movement to be, uh, lost my place, <laughs> to be the result of the Protestant conviction of sola scriptura, the Bible as the only standard of faith and practice for Christians. My Adventism surrounding me was starting to become part of me. Not because it was just some tradition that I grew up in and you know, was uh, exposed to in my household. That was important, that my parents represented the love of God correctly. That was important that you know, I, I grew up in a healthy environment. But it was also important that I learned I filled my mind, I had an intelligent faith, right, of why I believed what I believed. In the last few minutes, I'm going to tell a story. Right after that 10th grade year, going into 11th and 12th grade, I transferred to public school. I was so excited about my faith that I wanted to practice it outside of an Adventist bubble. I was like, mom and dad, I don't want to just go to public school because I'm trying to rebel or anything like that, but I really just want to live outside of Adventism and be able to be a light to a community of people that just don't know this message. And so they're like, we talked about it, and we're like, okay, we'll do it, right? I'm not saying you should run out, you know, and go to public school, talk it through with your parents, work it through, whatever, but for me, that was exciting because I got to live out my faith in a more secular place. During that time, I was able to share my faith in various different ways, but there's just one story that I want to bring things full circle for us this, now this afternoon. There was a girl that I met in photography class. Her name was Emily, and Emily just happened to be, you know, pretty cute, you know. And I'm a new student, I'm a new junior at this public school, and, uh, and Emily, one day after our photography class, she invited me to come and sit and eat lunch with her. And I knew where she sat. She sat in the middle of the cafeteria. I was a junior. She was a senior. And it was at this round table where, in my mind, all of the cool, popular kids met. And I was like, you know, I was trying to play cool. Like, yeah, yeah, I got time. You know, I can join. Inside, I was like, yes, Emily, I can't wait to go and eat lunch with her and meet more cool people. 
And so I go into the cafeteria, and, and I remember exactly, I purchased like a little round pizza. I had like a little milk carton um, that, and, and like a cookie, right? Not the healthiest meal, but I just, I got some lunch, and I was so excited. I was like, I got my meal. There's Emily over there, the cool kids' table. I'm invited, right? Who was invited? I was invited. I'm not just waltzing in like, hey, guys. It was like, I'm invited. So I get my tray, and I walk over to the table, right? I walk over to the table, and there's Emily. She's sitting right there. And guess what? There's a chair open right next to her. I was like, yes. So I go there, and, and, and I'm getting closer, and she, she doesn't see me yet. That's okay, because she invited me. I go, and, and, and I pull up the chair. She still doesn't notice me. And I put my tray down. Still doesn't notice me, but I was like, it's okay. She's talking to someone else, right? And then I, I just kind of, you know, I, I sit down next to her, and I'm there, and I'm sitting, and and now all these other people are like looking at me like, who's this guy, right? And there's Emily right next to me. She still hasn't noticed me. And I'm like, it's cool, it's cool, I'm gonna, and I just kind of like do one of these like, hey, 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 Emily. And she does one of these. She's talking, she's talking. Oh, hey. Have you... That was the most awkward, I was like, that, at that moment, I knew I, it was the worst moment of my life. I, I'd come, and now all these people are looking at me, and the girl who invited me is just literally giving me a cold shoulder, and I'm just like, that, have you ever had like that stomach feeling where it just literally seizes up, and you can't do anything? And I'm there, and, and I'm like, uh, okay, and I take a bite of my pizza, I couldn't chew it, my stomach just seized up, and eventually I just left, I went home, that day, and I was like, Mom, I should have never gone to public school. <laughs> but see, here's the thing that I learned from that Emily incident. Emily invited me to join her, right? But then she treated me like I didn't even exist. How many of us say a prayer, say, God, be with me today? And we invite Jesus to the table. Jesus, come have lunch with me. I can't wait to talk of you, talk with you, and get to know you. And Jesus is like, oh, I'm so excited. Jesus is gentle. He's not going to force his way in your life. And, and he comes, and he shows up at the table, and he pulls up, and he's like, they're, they're talking to someone else. They're giving me the cold shoulder. You see, friends, as you study prophecy, you will be compelled to realize, to have the sense that God is here. If God can foresee the end from the beginning in all of these major events in human history, how much more does he know what's going on in your life right now? Beloved, the sense of God's presence is the most important thing that you can walk out of this room with today. Knowing that God is with you, that he loves you, prophecy points to that reality, and don't treat Jesus giving him the cold shoulder. Talk with him, walk with him, is my prayer for you. Can't wait to share with you part two of my story tomorrow morning, but let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being present in our lives. Help us to believe that you're there, believe that you care, to not treat you like you don't exist, but to really have that confidence to believe you and take you at your word. Help us to study prophecy, to have a living faith and a confident faith is my prayer for everyone here this, even, this, this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless.